Saturday, February 29th. Throw on your bloody black tie best and join Dark Hills Gaming for a night of dancing, drinking, and horror. All in the name of charity. Proceeds from the Bloody Valentine Ball will go to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. The ball will be a gore-filled gala that will immerse you in a horror-themed high school dance, complete with prom pictures, interactive events, and a horror memorabilia auction. Two lucky guests will be voted Horror King and Queen, complete with full carry treatment. There will be a bloody bar, so bring cash and your ID. This is a 21-plus only event. Buy your ticket now at darkhillsgaming.com and help us support the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. guys welcome to the last musical episode of our little musical month of horror movie night and this week we are talking about cannibal the musical the most spadoinkel film in <laughs> the in the trauma library so i know that scott was not a fan of this what i knew that brian and i grew up on this but i want to take a second and and please deal with this for just a little bit i took the time to highlight things so i don't read the whole thing but uh i think that's important to read the foreword that Trey Parker wrote to Lloyd Kaufman's book, Make Your Own Damn Movie, The Secrets of a Renegade Director, which, side note, if you want to be a horror filmmaker, this is a really great book to read. Uh, but he tells the story of how this movie got picked up by Troma, and I think that it provides a lot of insight on the making of this movie, as well as Troma as a production company. So uh, this isn't the whole thing, it's a paraphrased version. But Lloyd Kaufman has had a profound effect on my life twice. The first time was when I was 13 and I rented a movie called The Toxic Avenger at my video store. I'll never forget the way that that movie inspired me. It made me realize that if a crappy movie like that could get good reviews and make it into video stores, then I could probably be a filmmaker too. So we made a movie, a ha- an hour and a half piece of shit called Cannibal the Musical, and it was indeed as crappy as Toxic Avenger, if not crappier. I believe now that having Cannibal and all of our short films from college was the main reason that we found success in Hollywood. We arrived in that town not with just one film to show, but dozens. Most importantly, by a lot of films from our younger years, one of those being a short film we made called South Park, it helped us arrive to L.A. with our own unique voice that we already had to find for ourselves. You see, Lloyd Kaufman knew years ago what most people have just now figured out. You don't need a big Hollywood studio to make a movie. Who, to hell with whether a movie should be shot in 5.6 or 5.8 split. Fuck that. Just start making the crap. Quality, quantity over quality. The first important lesson I learned from Lloyd Kaufman. The second lesson came 10 years later when I was 23 and I had the opportunity to meet him. It was 1995 and I was living in L.A. and sleeping on someone's floor and trying to sell Cannibal the Musical. After its completion, we were rejected from every single film festival except for the Denver Film Festival that my aunt worked at. And its it's relative success at some small screenings started to make us think that we could maybe sell it to a distributor. Uh, We've met a lot of people who told us that that Cannibal wasn't right for them, but they'd love to see our next movie. Then Troma called. They had seen the movie and were interested in distributing it. I was excited and thinking of all the things that had come full circle. We were told that Lloyd Kaufman himself was going to visit us in L.A. and we were going to do lunch. It had been almost three years since we had finished the film and it looked like we were finally going to make some money off of it. Lloyd arrived in our rundown apartment building wearing a chic blue suit and a very busy yellow tie. If someone asked me to create a cartoon character of a cliche Jewish man and a Mel, Bro- <laughs> and a Mel Brooks type producer from New York, I would have just drawn Lloyd and done the exact same voice that he has. He said, hi, I'm Lloyd Kaufman from Troma. I love your movie. Great stuff. You guys are brilliant. You ready to do lunch? And we said, sure, knowing that doing lunch in L.A. means meeting the meeting is going to be fairly serious. Where do you want to go? We asked. And he said, I saw a Del Taco across the street. You guys like Del Taco? (laughs) I do like Del Taco, for the record. (laughs) <laughs> I, studied, I studied Lloyd's face, seeing if he was one of those producers trying to be down to earth. 
But then I realized in his eyes that this man just really loves Del Taco. <laughs> <laughs> I can replay the meeting in my mind as if it happened hours ago. We placed our food orders and quickly realized that Loy had no intention of playing for our food. <laughs> in fact... <laughs> I saw that coming a mile away. When Jason offered to pay for Lloyd's beef taco with loads of hot sauce, Lloyd's face lit up and asked if he could also have guacamole on the side. <laughs> <laughs> we got our food and sat down and negotiations began. Lloyd began the conversation by unwrapping his taco and saying the cannibal was one of the best films that he had seen in recent months and wanted to distribute the film into video stores. We tried to contain our excitement and began our agree- working on the agreement. Okay, so how does this work deal? How does this deal work? He said, well... We're going to put a little bit more violence in the front of the movie and fix some of the sound issues and then make a nice video package with the Troma logo in the corner. And then hopefully people will rent it. And then maybe someday you'll make some money on it. And then we stopped eating our tacos. How much money are we going to get up front? Oh, nothing. Odds are you're never going to see a dime. This is a small movie and it'll take years at the video store before it ever gets its money back that we spent for shiny new boxes and posters. He finished this sentence with another bite into his messy taco with extra sauce and guacamole and added a heartfelt mmm at the end of the sentence. Uh, (laughs) Jason said, let me get this straight. You want us to just give you the rights to our movie, and we'll make nothing. Uh, That's the general offer, Lloyd responded. That's just sort of how it goes. Not much money being made in the video business unless you've got gremlins or something. God damn, this taco's really good. (laughs) Well, Well, then, I said, why should we even bother giving the movie to you? Well, I think Cannibal's a great movie, and that people should see it. I mean, you guys made it so people would see it, right? And that statement hit me in the face like a baseball bat. That was the second time he had a huge impact in my life. All these years making movies, I wanted people to see them, and that was it. We made Cannibal in college because we thought it'd be funny, and we wanted our friends and family to see it and laugh. And just four months in L.A. had made us lose sight of that and focus on money instead. Uh, Thanks to Lloyd, it became suddenly crystal clear. Cannibal is our first film, and it's never going to make us a fortune. But having it in video stores and having people around the country rent it, watch it, and say, what the fuck was this, like I had done years ago with Toxic Avenger was what it was all about. That's why we wanted to make movies. If you want to make money making movies, you have a better chance of just going to a casino and doubling down on uh, 13 Black. Your odds are much better of making money that way. However, if you want to make a movie because you want people to laugh, cry, and possibly puke, then read on, because no one knows how to make movies and not make any money doing it better than Lloyd Kaufman. (laughs) I like how Matt was like, I'm just going to, you know, do some of it. You did the whole fucking thing. No, it's a 10 minutes. that was a 10 page chapter that I went through today and highlighted the important parts of the story without the tangents. Man, the taco story is great though. So that's the breakdown of like this while watching this movie, keep in mind that this was a college project made by a bunch of 20 year olds in Denver, just trying to learn how to make a movie. <laughs> that's not what bugs me about this movie though. What well, bugs me about yeah. this movie is that the, the songs aren't good. Mm. That's I mean, the only thing that this had to do for me. How dare you? So I was going to say the flip side of this, though, is honestly, and this is uh, an important thing to know, is that when Trey Parker and Matt Stone were in college, they were there for film. But Trey Parker was a double major as a music student and also as uh, a minor in Japanese, uh, which explains a lot of this movie. But Cannibal the Musical, of the four movies that we watched for this, actually has the most musical structure in the sense that it opens with an overture. It has a lot of reprisals of songs. Um, and the, the advertising was, it's like Oklahoma meets Friday the 13th part two, which is I mean, techni- technically Tenacious D had an overture, but it was just, it would, they just use Kickapoo and BL's a boss, <laughs> but <laughs> they still fair, yeah. technically had one. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, this, uh, the opening scene was, as we learned in that story, was added by Troma in the beginning, uh, just to kind of up the gore right out the gate, which I do love that opening scene, um, where it's just Trey Parker killing everybody in stupid, violent ways. Uh, mm-hmm. And he does the same thing in that, uh, where his teeth go, ah, blah, 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 just like in <laughs> basketball when he puts the, um, the <laughs> aluminum foil in his mouth. <laughs> I think my favorite part in that whole scene, though, is there's just a random close-up of his face leaning into the camera and goes, gah, 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 gah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, but, he's so fucking funny. But that whole scene happens, and then it cuts immediately to the court scene, and there's a guy in the background who just goes, ow, grab! <laughs> <laughs> so the weird thing about this movie, and I was telling this to Scott a little bit, is that this is the most historically accurate movie we may have ever talked about on this show (laughs) 
because they went as far as like that trial is shot in the actual courtroom that the real Alfred Packer's trial took place in. Oh my God. The scenes in the prison are shot in the actual prisons that Alfred Packer was held in. Like they really wanted to make this all as authentic to the actual telling of Alfred Packer's story as possible, <laughs> but filled with their comedy, which makes it really weird homages. You've got like the Friday the 13th homage of the doomsayer, like warning them about going forward. Oh yeah, and, you're yeah. doomed, doomed. <laughs> you're well, doomed. It, it's so funny because watching this, I'm like, I never realized that they had so much horror background. Oh yeah, no, mm -hmm. they they appear in like seven different trauma movies because they love working with Lloyd, and then like I think Lloyd pops up in one of their movies as well. But yeah, like. They were shooting or they were writing Orgasmo while they were like touring around with trying to sell Cannibal. And I think when they first started shooting Orgasmo was when they got the offer for South Park. Like it was like a whole bunch of stuff happened to rapid fire with them. They they need to they need to remake Orgasmo now that they are successful. Why? Yeah. Orgasmo is perfect as it is. They wrote a musical and they uh, weren't allowed to release it. Yeah. Orgasmo was a musical. That's but amazing. They didn't, they didn't have a name. So even if they like use their uh, Book of Mormon success to do maybe not on Broadway, but like an off Broadway production of Orgasmo, I would still say it. Yeah, I, I just want to hear the songs. <laughs> well, and like, that's the thing that's funny is that you think about it. Every feature film that they've personally Gone made besides, besides Orgasmo is, is a musical. A musical. Yeah, yeah, South Park was a musical. Team, Team America. America was a musical. Like, yeah, they, Man, they love their Team musicals. Team America is so good. <laughs> you know, I I gotta let me temper this before you keep going. My lack of enjoyment watching this movie—I was so bored watching this movie. The, the <laughs> pacing is fucking garbage, too. I mean, I—I I, I did give them the benefit of the doubt. There's the first movie they ever made. They're just learning the ropes, and I—I I, I couldn't make a movie, I, so I'm not—you know—I'm not giving them a hard time about that. But, um, you know, I, I just feel like. I like everything else that they have done except for South Park. I don't give two shits about South Park, but I've liked every other movie and I, I have not seen Book of Mormon, but I've heard some songs from it and it's catchy. Fun <laughs> fact about South Park. South Park was almost a trauma show. And yeah. the only reason a, a it trauma wasn't, show. Yeah. Yeah. Like they the, were going to produce it. <laughs> yeah. The only reason it didn't work out for trauma was because Lloyd wouldn't budge that he didn't want the characters in South Park. He wanted them in Tromaville. <laughs> it was like his biggest mistake he said <laughs> was was tromaville where the toxic crusaders tv show cartoon the cartoon was tromaville is like unofficially where all of the things that lloyd kaufman <laughs> well, personally I, produced I know that place, but, but i mean yeah yeah it was in toxic crusaders <laughs> oh my god toxic crusaders we should do a bonus tv or a bonus uh bonus series on the tv show yeah. I don't know if I could watch all like 50 some episodes, but I'd totally be down to watch. They they edited the first four episodes into a feature length movie, and I would totally do that for the uh, Patreon guys, folks. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I agree. I will agree that like I think that I like the songs because I've watched it so many times. But I agree that they are very quickly thrown together songs. And the jokes are very, like the when I was on top of you joke is not as funny to me as it was when I was, you know, 17 watching this in high school oh the yeah, horse the, one the, yeah but the yeah. the jokes that don't land anymore there was other jokes that were overlooked i feel yeah. like 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 spadoinkel the the intro to spadoinkel where he starts describing leanne and then you slowly realize it's a horse he's like she goes really fast like this and then <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then i know this is stupid brian kelly but you will always get me to laugh the end of the song when he's just like spadoinkly day and he's got that like dumb little smile <laughs> there's a bunch of scenes I, I've said before that the commentary track for Cannibal the Musical might be the greatest commentary track that's ever been recorded but two scenes in the movie that they've called out as such a waste of film for a stupid joke and the first one is when they're entering the store and it keeps cutting back and forth to each one oh walking my God, in going yeah. howdy <laughs> so Dude, annoying. There's one scene that I thought Scott would love, and I I thought Scott loved the movie, and I'm I'm shocked. Wait, you and I wonder if they're you don't know me at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I was watching it, and I was like, oh no, no. <laughs> I, I thought the the after the trapper song was such a dumb bit that Scott would love, 
Oh, fighting over what <laughs> note they were singing? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Leonard I was singing I, with F sharp major. <laughs> The I, song's written in A flat minor. <laughs> I smiled. <laughs> I love the Trapper song. Just for the joke of the Trapper song was that they promised the one dude they would redub his singing voice because he couldn't sing, and then they just kept it in because they thought it was funny how bad he was. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> I've met the one of the Trappers. A couple times because he's friends with Jonathan from from Geekscape. He's completely disowned this movie. He's gotten a good career for being a cinematographer, but this was his first work. And he's like, yeah, no, it was fun. <laughs> like, like, that's like all he'll say. Like, he does not want to talk about this movie at all. Dude, I don't know why. I don't. I love anyone that loves their their starting off point well i think i think a big part of it is every time he comes to our table like geekscape's table is infamously right next to troma's table and lloyd's always at the troma table so every time that he comes by lloyd's just like robert look what's on the tv and he has like kind of all the musical plays (laughs) embrace it man like i don't i don't want to hear any fucking excuse dude the hangover the hangover limitless like during this era of bradley cooper just being a ultimate hollywood superstar he went back and filmed the series for wet hot american summer and those are people that i will love for like will always love even i I loved i love childish gambino but he's making it so we can't have a community movie because he doesn't want to go back to it and i don't like that let's let's unpack that for just a second here because i can I love when a megastar is still humble enough to to take time out of getting paid, you know, like twenty million dollars to do some shitty rom com where he gets to kiss a beautiful woman and then goes and does Wet Hot American Summer because, I mean, would it really be Wet Hot American Summer without his character? It would be harder to to enjoy. But then also, if Donald Glover doesn't feel like there's value in going back to Community then that's okay. I will say one of the unsung heroes for this movie to me is, uh, and he can be really obnoxious in the movie, but I think that some of the best lines come from Matt Stone's character. (laughs) There's the one scene where they're like eating their first person and the the butcher starts cutting into the butt and he's like, wait, why are you cutting into the butt? He's like, well, what do you want to eat? And he's like, not butt. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I think like he wakes up the next morning. He's like, I'm hungry. Do we have any swan left? <laughs> that like, is a funny line. Like, he's just so walking around with swan's head the whole time. It's <laughs> so shitty. <laughs> <laughs> what were you saying, Scott? What's Squeak's name in this? Because I, 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 that's all I know him as. Yeah. Squeak, I can't even remember. He is also... I think one of those actors who I just love seeing him in things. I like I get so excited when he pops up in fucking anything. To the Orgasmobile. What? <laughs> My Buick Century. Uh, George. George George Noon is who he played in this. Dad, I don't think I want to do hamster style anymore. <laughs> okay, son. <laughs> <laughs> See, if they had made that a musical, we could be discussing that instead. I know. I love, one of the things that makes me laugh is the shitty, uh, the really weird ballet sequence where it's so obvious that it's a stunt double during like any of the ballet sequences. <laughs> yeah, pretty pretty funny. But also the guy that plays the main trapper is really the dancer, right? I think so, yeah. yeah. I think Which he is, actually can dance. <laughs> so odd. Like this movie is just so odd. Yeah. There's that shot where, like, it's the cl- like you can see it's Trey Parker and he trips over the set during the <laughs> <Yeah>. ballet. <laughs> like, also, you left out probably my favorite Matt Stone moment, which is like, holy shit, I just thought of something. What? Remember when he was singing about the snowman? How did he make those tap dancing sounds in the snow? <laughs> <laughs> you just thought of that? It was weird. <laughs> uh, I think we all know that the best joke in the whole fucking movie is the Cyclops. Are you looking at my eye? Are you <laughs> looking at my eye? <laughs> yeah. That is the best sequence, oh, yes. No. Are you looking at my eye? No, no, no. no, no. Yeah, eventually they're just sick of it. <laughs> well, someone pointed out that like another one of the layers of stupid niche jokes in this movie is that it follows the plot line of Homer's The Odyssey. <laughs> And that's why there's a Cyclops there. And in the beginning of it, one of the characters is reading the Odyssey. Oh, my like, God. 
Like, it's just so there's a after the ballet scene, Packer wakes up from his nightmare after being stabbed and he yells Ike. And the only reason he does that is because while researching the movie, he watched as many films about Alfred Packer as he could. And one of them, Alfred Packer wakes up from a nightmare screaming Ike. And he's like, well, that's kind of weird. And just wrote it into the movie as a reference. So like, wow. like I said, this movie's just like, he researched the shit out of making this, this weird little college film, which I don't even think was for a project. Like they shot this on their own during the off, like during like winter break. <laughs> but uh, I'm trying to think, is there anything else? Oh, my favorite, one of, one of the things I really, really like in this movie, and I used to not even notice it, but it's, you know, you have the big song, the It's All I'm Asking For song, which is, you know, the, the state, it's in any musical, there's the song where the characters explain exactly what they are doing and what their goal is in the, the show. And then they're all dying outside. And one of them's like, I just want to survive. That's all I'm asking for. And then the music for It's All I'm Asking For is playing underneath as a reprise, but they're all too dying to really <laughs> sing the song. So they're just mumbling it to themselves. And then they all just put their hands out like it's the shit, like they're about to take the bow at the end of the song. It's like it's those little jokes that I think still work for me. But I I'm kind of seeing Scott's perspective of it as well, where it's like, man, you could take those jokes and like do this movie with like a tighter like a tighter soundtrack and like really make this hit but like i, I don't know man i watched this movie so many times in college like it will never not be great for me the the joke of him trying to kill that dude for like 40 <laughs> different ways is still really funny to me even though i've seen it done like a thousand times i love it also the hang the bastard song <laughs> like, the only song that actually i liked and you know, and enjoyed listening to was the uh, the the one that the woman oh, sings. Yeah, the one that she sings, which also has the joke that I love of the the person walking into the scene and realizing that they're in the middle of a musical number and not sure what to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I actually thought that that was a pretty good song. Yeah, and he ended up. Uh, so one of the things that I learned when I was researching it was that one of the only scenes that they reshot years later was their final kiss at the end of the movie. Because Trey Parker was very uncomfortable kissing someone on screen. But then after they finished making this movie, they ended up dating for like two years. And he was like, you know, what? we could probably redo that kiss. And I'd probably feel a lot more comfortable and confident doing it this time. I would fucking hope. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's 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 a fun enough movie. It's no little shop. We probably should have ended with little shop to be totally honest. Well, the the this is the way that we structured the month and I'll just tell listeners so that they understand. Uh, well, <clears throat> the way that it worked out was that Matt got the first week, Brian got the second week, I got the third week, and then we agreed uh, uh, because Matt and Brian had talked about how great Cannibal the musical was and I had said I've never seen it. And then they said, well, why don't we just pick that as like the the, the final finale. one? And I yeah. said, sure. So, you know, that's that's the way it fell. And it's not. I, I remember that part. I don't know why I thought that you had maybe seen this just because of how much like you like all of their other non South Park stuff. But mm -hmm. yeah, when I was watching it, that's when I was like, I don't think Scott's seen this before because this does not seem like a movie that Scott's going to like. Yeah, I never <laughs> said I. I... <laughs> I feel like over five years, I've gotten pretty good at like knowing what you will or won't like. So I'm never like, Brian's still new to it. So when you say you don't like something, Brian's like, what? But for me, I'm like, yeah, no, it makes sense. <laughs> I just <laughs> want Scott to like the things I like. <laughs> because Scott's such a great dude. You want to just be like, hey, let's hang out and watch Cannibal the Musical together. And no. he'll be like, fuck yeah, I fucking love Cannibal the Musical. Let's sing along and quote it together. <laughs> no, and then you give each all... other hand jobs. <laughs> like... <laughs> okay, that I can get behind. No, I... I... <laughs> <laughs> that I can um, wrap my hands around. <laughs> <laughs> Brian and Ant could wrap its hands around that. Ooh, goddamn! Uh, that is no, a, a diss to Scott and not me because we're jerking each other off. So restructure yeah, uh, that diss. No, I knew what the diss was. The thing about me is that one, I'm not a nice guy. <laughs> Two, I, no one's actually trying to please me, and that's fine. But like, I just love the fact that Brian is always shocked. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's basically like the the, the Shocks Pikachu every week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've never thought about that, but that's such an accurate depiction of Brian every time that we click record. Oh, dude. All right. So that was Cannibal the Musical. Uh, double features. Uh, anybody got one that they wanted like, just charge in with since no one specifically I... picked this? Basketball. <laughs> okay. Perfect. I'm going to take my night by watching basketball. Uh, I wrote down because of the doomed scene and because of how this was advertised uh friday the 13th part two okay that'd be how a, about you brian odd fucking no bro matt's like you know for mine my double feature i am going to actually read homer's the odyssey <laughs> <laughs> so this is the first time that i've watched this movie after actually hearing songs from oklahoma so I will say that the comparison to this being inspired by Oklahoma, which is apparently Trey Parker's favorite musical of all time, is very apparent because it is very <laughs> much the same type of music. Man, Oklahoma. <laughs> like, I've watched that twice with Megan because uh, I never gave it a, a chance, you know, before we started dating. And Not for you? No. The only song that I like is, uh, well, the thing is that we quote it constantly because like, show, um you know, we'll be pushing a, a a piece of furniture or something, and I'll be like, "It's about as far as it can go," you know, or something like that. Or, um, you know, so Scott, you picked basketball and not Mulan. Well, I, <laughs> I didn't even make the joke. I made the joke off air that um, it's all I'm asking for. Sounds like a girl worth fighting for. Yeah. <laughs> now, if I was sitting down with Megan, I would absolutely try and redeem myself by being like, "So that sucked." You want to watch Mulan again? Because Mulan is her favorite uh, uh, Disney musical. That's going to get a shout out from me. What, what Megan's going to get a shout out from you for what? No, Mulan is when we do oh. our bonus episode. Oh. Oh, fuck oh. yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I fucking love. I never watched Mul Mulan. was. I was already in high school, I think, when it came out. And so I didn't watch it. But um, it's so good. It is just so fucking good. I love every second of that movie. And Megan and I saw the preview for the Mulan movie, which I have been avoiding like the plague because I was like, oh, they're taking out the music and it's going to there, there's not going to be like the things that I know and enjoy about Mulan. We had to sit through the preview, uh, the trailer um, before Rise of Skywalker. And she and I were almost in tears with how excited we are. Yeah, it looks it. really fucking good. It looks and sick. I'm not excited for it. Well, you need to fucking sit your ass down. Yeah, get get fucking excited, Brian. They, God damn it! They got there's, rid of the dragon. There's going to be Brian. A, Eddie Murphy is the worst part of Mulan. I, yeah, I'll but first of all, right Eddie now. Murphy is the worst part of the movie. But also, the Mulan, <laughs> the live action Mulan, is doing the best service to a Disney animated movie that they could because they fucked up with Aladdin and Lion King. Now, don't say anything, Brian. I know mm -hmm. you're going to shit yourself. I'm going to yeah, get I'm angry. Like, mm -hmm. In Mulan, <laughs> I like the fact that they're going a little bit more serious. And so you can't have Eddie Murphy being like, wah, every two seconds because he's annoying. No, but you could have Kevin Hart do it. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing about Kevin Hart is when – uh, people like celebrities do impressions of Kevin Hart to Kevin Hart's face. Oh, dude, he loves it. I don't think there's ever been anyone who's enjoyed people doing an impression of them in front of them more than Kevin Hart. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, I'm very excited for Mulan. Okay. Brian, you still haven't said what your double feature is going to be, and I apologize. Uh, my double feature will be South Park, Bigger, Better, and Uncut, because we have been watching Fuck a lot of musicals. Classics. And I think out of... The three, I, I guess they did three, not counting their actual Broadway show. Um, it is the most actual musical, I feel like, put together. Yeah. Orchestra. You should have picked that instead of... It's, dude, the songs in that are so fucking good. Yeah. La Resistance is a fucking, just amazing Yeah, song. it's a, they're like... It's un insanely talented, and and I that's why I love South Park. I, I just love Trey Parker and Matt Stone because they, they can get as insane as they want. This is just the two of them doing pretty much everything. Yeah, like like they get so ridiculous and either A, there's a lot of talent behind it within like the music, the storytelling, and like pe people take for granted how like they really can make you think and bring a good message to the most ridiculous backstory. Like it always <laughs> ends where it's like a look at society, but it's the whole episode is the most ridiculous shit ever. I, I will say that 
it it wasn't until literally just the second that I realized that like I listened to the South Park musical and in my brain it's like man they got all these like it's all these songs sung by different characters but like in reality it's a it's a bunch of songs just sang by two guys doing multiple different voices and singing in those different voices yeah <laughs> like that's kind of wild I, I've never thought about it from that perspective but that's dope all right things that you want to promote uh, I, only I, a woman <laughs> only a woman uh, so I will say and I'll keep this quick because it's not really tied to horror movies and this is going to be so after the fact that I don't know how things are playing out, but I'm going to assume that I saw uh, what will be the Academy Award winning film for Best Picture and checked out 1917, which I'm not a war movie guy. This is absolutely the best war movie I've ever seen and it is the most incredible cinematic experience I've ever seen. They have done such an impressive thing of shooting a movie that the concept is just these two guys have to get from one war zone to the other war zone in X amount of hours and the camera never cuts and never moves from them and is just one long continuous shot of them as they're like running through the, the trenches and like going into different areas and then like there's slow periods where they talk and you get to know a little bit of their backstory about like who they were before they were shipped off to war and like it's just this ebb and flow of like nonstop tense energy. It's it's amazing. Like I, if you are a film person at all, you owe it to yourself to see 1917 at least once. So that's mine. Brian or Scott, go. Um, mine is I'm 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 two years late to the party, uh, but <laughs> since Jade, every time Jade leaves, I try to watch a a random series that I don't think she would have any interest in. Um, so I put on the defiant ones that came out like two years ago on HBO and I was so sucked into it. I, I watched, I watched it all in a day. I just couldn't, I couldn't stop watching it. Um, it is about, it's about Dr. Dre and Jimmy Levine, but the way that they, the way that it shot is so, it's so insane because they show before, like the first few episodes are really before Jimmy Levine and Dr. Dre get together so it's like dr dre easy e ice cube and then it like cuts to like stevie nicks tom petty um and like all these people that that jimmy levine produced and like it's it's crazy to think and obviously he's in the documentary so he can really paint the image however you want but you always like think like oh you know, these record producers are just like capitalizing on shit. But Jimmy Levine's whole shtick for everything, even like when he was dealing with Tom Petty, when he was dealing with Marilyn Manson, when he was dealing with Nine Inch Nails, was like, let the artist drive the car and defend them till till the end, you know? And it paid off 90% of the time. Uh, the, the one time that it really bought, like, bit him in the ass was Death Row with Suge Knight. But it was just like, it, it's such a fascinating documentary. It's so fascinating. And the people that yeah, are in the one. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> man. I, I actually want to watch it again. I have a real downer, and I'm just going to say it real quick. I, I watched uh, Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers because mm. I was I, it was on my long list for Horror Movie Night, and I was like, let me just see if it's got enough meat on the bone to, to make for a good episode. It doesn't. It's very – the whole thing is – the thing that really turned me off about it was – it's bombastic, yeah, but it's presented as a crime noir. So you got the hard-boiled private dick talking to the camera or to, you know, voiceover into the camera, you know, and she's got that, great tits, you know, stuff that like can, that. It's that just, can really strike out. <laughs> so, like, if it's done well as a good film noir, it works. If it's done for comedic effect, it tends to really not work very well. <laughs> I can tell you... There's only one film noir that has worked in the last 20 fucking years. Or two. Two of them. Sin City. Brick. Those are the only good ones that I've never seen. I agree, seen. but I raise you a Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. <laughs> See, I watched Kiss Kiss Bang Bang back in like, mm, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And, oh no, actually, I think I watched Kiss Kiss, Kiss, Kiss Bang Bang. That's Robert Downey Jr. and um, Val Kilmer, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I watched that with Megan the first couple months that we were together. So that was 10 years ago. And uh, it's good, but 
I don't think I ever have a desire to rewatch. Sin City, I can just put on and fall asleep to because it's visually amazing. And Brick, I just love because it's, you know, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Did you see, oh, okay, I was going to say, did you see Knives Out? Because Knives Out was like the best film Rain Johnson's made since Brick. For No, like, I haven't miles. watched it. I might watch it on VOD with Megan, but yeah, I, I, it, I, the only thing it, that, it's like Clue for 2019, I get it. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, I would say it's that mixed with like an Agatha Christie story, but like, I would say it's almost even more Agatha Christie because it's not. I'm trying to say, I think how to word this where it's not, it's not so much about the who done it. Like it, it's, someone posted in our Facebook group about this, but I agree, it it has a lot more in common with like a Ready or Not, where it's way more about a film making fun of like rich like rich people than it is about the mystery behind everything because it's like the the main focus of the story is the the person who's been murdered's servant or or like live-in housekeeper person who like no one like it's just the way that the rest of the family interacts with her is like more what the movie's about with the murder mystery in the background to drive everything but it's very funny. It's very well done. And also like fucking Captain America is great in it. So <laughs> <laughs> that is Jake. <laughs> Jakey, Jakey about to make, make a big, big mistake. <laughs> you know how many people I have seen with that fucking sweater? It's everywhere. <laughs> All right, so that was Cannibal the Musical, shot in 1993, but released in 1996. Uh, as picked by, I guess, all of us, group decision, whatever. If you go into the podcast description, you have links to all of our social media, our email address, and even our Patreon, patreon.com backslash HMM podcast. But if you need to know what to ha- what's happening over on that Patreon account, well, if you jump over there, there's going to be a brief, I'd say like 15-minute-ish discussion about our favorite songs from musicals. So go and check that out. And we will be back next week with, you know, a movie that reminds us that the long arm of the law can get you. And you got to be careful with how you act. So come in next Prepare week. Prepare to and get fucked out. by the long dick of the law. Oh shit. <laughs> We're watching Sheriff long arms. I love that movie. <laughs> We can't catch him. He's 20 yards away. This looks like a job for <laughs> Sheriff Longarms. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listening to the Geekscape Network. You're listening to the Geekscape Network.